is live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. We've managed to relocate on the dark main beast known as Tenyor. This is Safari Live. and what a way to start the sunset safari with of course a big male lion here in the sabi sand my name is taylor and on camera with me today bringing you the most amazing footage is sebastian and well this is a live and interactive safari perhaps this is your first time watching us a big warm welcome to all of you you can hashtag safari live on twitter with any questions that you may have for us but should we have another look at our friend over here now he hasn't actually moved at all from where we left him this morning he's sitting in exactly the same spot in fact he's actually moved further away from the guari tree now he hasn't got his he uh, his face shoved into it and he is still hot he is still full and for now he doesn't seem to look like he's going to be doing anything else other than digesting all of that zebra that is in his belly and occasionally he stares at us, he opens his eyes and reveals his beautiful golden colour that he has got as well, his, his eyes. It is really a fantastic afternoon. I was a bit worried. I was glad that the sun came out so that he didn't move too far because it would be a nightmare to have tried to relocate him through this block. If, especially if he went down into the drainage system. There's too many Tsumbwerti trees around here and when they form a thicket they're impenetrable. So luckily for us, I think today is going to be a good day. And it seems as though if you were watching the pre-show, Tristan has already picked up on some male leopard tracks. Hopefully they're fresh ones, ones that it will indicate that there was a leopard moving in between game drive. And he'll be able to find them. Like I say, Ali and Tristan have incredible luck. I actually don't think it's luck. I think it's skill when it comes to tracking and finding leopards. They're very, very lucky. Me on the other hand, well, I think I just get lucky <laughs> every now and then. Sometimes tracking works for me. But how cool is this? We, it's been a very, very long time since we last had, of course, we last had a cat to open up the show. Oh, look at that. Look how he's just looking up towards the sky. There's vultures circling above him. Now, we won't be able to see the vultures. They've obviously spotted him from the sky, so we'll keep an eye out on him. However, it's not just Tristan and I out driving about. James is also going to be joining us. So let's go across to the wide open plains of the Mara. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari. Well, we are sitting here in the Maasai Mara of Kenya, obviously. Uh, my name is James Hendry. There we go. And you can talk to me in the same way that you can talk to Taylor using the hashtags for our life. Fergus is on camera. That is Fergus's shaking thumb. That's more steady. And what we have over here is a very large grouping of wildebeest very far away. Uh, probably, I would say, as the crow flies, uh, about 1,500 meters, so about a mile or so. They're just across there, and then there's another group off to the right-hand side of where they are. Now, our plan this afternoon is to see if we can't get in amongst them and see if they aren't perhaps being hunted by a number of cats. The idea, of course, being to set up, well, our first TV show, uh, well, our second TV show, the first one was more of a sneak peek than a real episode, which, of course, is going to go out on Friday, and that is Friday evening for you in the States, 11 p.m. Eastern Time, and uh, you'll be able to watch it there. And if you're not in the United States watching Nat Geo Wild, well, then you can... Watch it on the internet if you'd like to at wildsafarilive.com. So, I think we should drive down there straight away and see if we can't get in amongst them and find the cats that are, should be hunting them. 
Thank you very much, all of you. Still complimenting my hat. It was a, it was an impulse buy. What can I say? You know, an impulse buy. I thought, even though the sun is very bright out here normally, and so I better have something to protect my rapidly aging face. Let's head across to Tristan, who I believe is uh, dressed. Yeah, well. He was a bit, probably a mixture between a, a gangster and um, an old school Bedouin. Well, good afternoon everybody and welcome to our Sunset Safari. As James mentioned, my name is Tristan and I have got Craig, aka the Batman, on board. Now I'm sorry if my audio is not very good, it's because my mic has probably slipped in amongst my hairdo here. So this is my punishment apparently for not actually finding a leopard this morning. So now I'm trying to fix it. Hold on. I'm trying to get the mic right. Just that it's a little bit to the side. So hold on, Meg, so I'll get it right now. now. Let's get that off because otherwise we're going to have a huge problem. Now it's not always this crazy, and for those of you who are a bit more serious, it is interactive, it is live, which means you can ask any questions at hashtag Safari Live, and I will be sorting out this ridiculous mess that is on my head. So if I can just get it into this little hole that we have here on my cap, then I should be able to sort it out. Is that better, Craig? Megan, are we better now? Now, I came to the hyena den hoping that... That there might be some sort of sign of hyenas. Oh, my hair's falling out. This is not good. I might have to attend to that and get a little bit of some sort of product on my hair to make sure. And I thought there were no hyenas here, but now it's gone. There was one right behind me and it's just disappeared. I don't know where it went. I think it might have gone back into the hole. So I'm just going to just try and see if I can't just turn a little bit better so that you can see what I'm talking about. But basically... And there was a hyena standing on the top of the mound two seconds ago. I think it's gone back down because it came out just to see what the commotion was. It was one of the younger ones, looked like Intima, which is a little hyena cub that was born in around February. And it's here with its little, well, with another hyena cub, which is a lot smaller than little Intima. And so Intima is still quite sort of curious and likes to come out when there's noise and all kinds of other things. Right. Well, I think she's probably gone inside because there's no adults, so maybe what we'll do is we're going to carry on and we'll come back to the hyena den just now. I don't think she'll come out. I think she just came out just to see what was going on. Once she's sort of decided that there's not really much in terms of adults, she's going to go back in. So I'm going to probably come back a little bit later because I don't want to be here if the adults are not here. The other tiny cub that's in the den is a little bit small. But oh no, much of my hair has fallen out. Now I know how James Hendry must feel when his hair falls out. Pouty Gorilla, you say I need some marula oil for my hair. I know it's a bit it's a bit straw-like, isn't it? And a little bit on the frizzy side, so we need some serious attention. It also doesn't really flap in the breeze. We'll have to ask Taylor to flap in the breeze like she does with her hair. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the most comfortable thing, so I'm not sure what the bet was with Scotty and with Alice, because this is all Alice's idea. So I don't know how long I actually have to keep it like this. So hopefully it won't be too long, because my brain feels like it's being compressed through a small hole and I'm sure it's going to pop at some point and so I'm going to hope that I can fix all of this and decide to take it all off because well one is it's hot and two it's squashing my brain in the meantime though speaking of hair and golden locks and flowing in the breeze I'm pretty sure Miss Taylor McCurdy who's sitting with the magnificent Tino can give you a far better example of how to shake your hair in the golden light Thank you, Tristan. At least you didn't call my hair yellow. <laughs> Remember that one time Brent said I had yellow hair? It was very funny. I found it quite hilarious. But yes, well, I suppose may Tenure and our hair's, oh, his mane is maybe similar to mine. I think it's slightly messier. He doesn't put a brush through it, of course, although sometimes I can't even get a brush through my hair. It gets like a bird's nest. But wasn't that amazing? Just before we sent you across to James, now Sebastian and I have been discussing it quite a bit now um, since you've left us. When he turned and looked up towards the sky, how did he know that those vultures were up there? Because those vultures were far away. They were just black dots in the sky to Sebastian and I. Did he hear them? 
because he had his eyes closed or did he just open one of them and happen to spot that dot in the very far distance because it was absolutely incredible the response that he had and cats often do that cats will use birds to try and find food and vice versa vultures will search for predators to try and find their next meal too perhaps they've already flown past him today and realized that he hasn't got a kill nearby or that he's just hiding it very well we know that he doesn't have a kill but remember we often see the big cats dragging carcasses and hiding them underneath trees or for a leopard you'll hide it in a tree that has lots of leaves to conceal it from the vultures but they've all moved off now they've gone into a different area and also that those vultures are able to see so well from as far up in the sky as what they were but it's it's quite warm now the breeze that we started uh, getting this morning has com almost completely died down now there's uh, just the grass is slightly moving and it is nice it's a little bit cool but I think he's gonna rest for quite some time I think Sebastian said he's gonna start moving at about five o'clock I reckon around 430 we might get some yawns and grooming mm. but we have a question from Jeffa and the question is do lion coalitions add another member to the coalition when one of them dies uh, not necessarily however I have and actually I don't think it's not very common at all to replace a member and remember the Birmingham's at one point used to be five but unfortunately one of them succumbed to a buffalo injury and passed on leaving just the four of them and they haven't found a replacement though a replacement is not necessarily is not necessary he's looking at the vultures again but again you won't be able to see them they're just they're straight above the camera which is virtually impossible to get but what I have seen, which is quite interesting, and I've told the story before, when I was guiding down in the southern sector of the sands, there were two old male lions that were, I suppose, in their retirement years, just as Mvula is in. They weren't really marking territories anymore. They'd occasionally roar, but they weren't interested in, in finding some females. They were well past that. They couldn't compete with the younger males in the area. And what they ended up doing, these two males, they aren't related at all, joined up, which I thought was quite interesting. And at a late age, I mean, the one was about 12 and the other male must have been about 10 years old. And within a couple of months, we started to see them hanging around together. Then they were inseparable. So how amazing is that? That two males from completely different walks of life, sort of their paths joined and they decided, well, we're getting old now. We're not interested in the ladies. It's easier to hunt if there's two of us why don't we just join up and that's exactly what they did they eventually disappeared and I think they went into um, the Kruger around the Paul Kruger gate and I haven't heard of them or seen any pictures of them since so perhaps they passed on they were quite old though too like I said but 10 and 12 that's sort of the end uh, of the life expectancy of a male lion but as this boy sits here and pants away he's not just panting he is he, well we're unfortunately sitting downwind of him too so you can imagine the smells that arise every now and then it's um i don't know if it's actually the lion or sebastian's just blaming tenure <laughs> if it would be me then always me to the hospital <laughs> <laughs> or is it me yeah exactly seb says if it was him he needs to be rushed to the emergency yeah. room yeah it's, it sounds it smells like your intestines are rotting but that's what happens when you feed on a, a diet of just protein and for any of you that perhaps have young sons that are into gymming and need to supplement their diet with protein shakes you will know then um, what your sons or maybe you're just at the gym you'll know exactly what your flatulence smell like it's not particularly pleasant and it's not pleasant with the lion either now an interesting question and hopefully Tenor will open his mouth for this one it's from Martin all the way in in Texas and it is do lions get food stuck in their teeth I'm sure oh my goodness he stinks <laughs> that was a bad one hey Seb yes. sure my goodness I'm gonna have to get a mask on or something or at least uh, maybe hold a nice smelling flower to my nose while we sit here sorry Martin <laughs> we will um we will of course not have to worry about that maybe we'll reposition at some point and so sorry Martin and um, so I'm sure they do they've obviously got teeth that specialize in cutting the flesh and then they're sort of able to tear it 
and and swallow it so I'm sure to an extent they get all types of things stuck in their teeth but I don't think it bothers them as much as it bothers us as humans I mean that's the first we always put toothpicks out of the table before you go to bed at night you floss your teeth well you should be flossing your teeth if there are any children watching you must remember to floss your teeth otherwise the tooth fairy or the tooth mouse won't come and visit you and uh, just yes <laughs> digressed severely there but um yeah so it's very it's important very important for us but for them it's not necessarily the case at all they're all right now he's staring at me every time i move maybe he's admiring my long ponytail mm -hmm. I don't have a door so if I do shuffle he can see these movements so it's not like I'm completely concealed I'm not standing up and breaking the silhouette but remember the way that the lion's eyesight is designed is they pick up the slightest movement very easily so even the way that I talk with my hands I often have to watch myself when I'm in a cat sighting and put my hands under my arms or I have to sit on them otherwise they do start watching I've had it before where I was talking and I was so excited and my tracker said to me Mafazi, he always used to call me Mafazi which is, uh, it means woman but when the Shangani men say it to you it's like a term of endearment they don't mean it in a disrespectful way at all and he says Mafazi, watch your hands so I'm like, oh, what are you talking about and this female line from the Southern Pride was just going like this she was sitting quite a distance away she was just following me she was just, oh, that's very interesting whatever I'm doing with my hands so it's always always important to make sure that you're not uh, that you are careful but he doesn't seem to be bothered by us barring when he stares up at the the vultures that are flying ahead he looks down at us oh he looks across at us but he's more worried about catching some z's this afternoon and and i'm sure he's hoping that that uncomfortable full feeling will disappear I've always wondered, and this is obviously something that we can't tell, we can't ask a lion, we, we, we can't really communicate with them at all, but you know what happens when you overeat, often it ends up in a stomach ache. And I wonder if they at any point in their life also get severe cramps from overindulging. What do you think, Seb? Or do you think that they're just so used to eating like that, that that's the, the way that it's nothing that's no more? You think they're used to it? Mm. Yeah. Just, I always think about these things. Is obviously I try and think how I feel after a big meal, and I go, Phew, "I had a belly." That's like that's like eating the entire turkey at Christmas yourself, with all the sides, with the roast potatoes, and the pumpkin, and anything else that you like to have with it. He's had it all. He's had a five-course meal for five people, but he's eaten it just himself. That's what he looks like at the moment. There seems to be also a few more flies buzzing about today. He's twitching his ears, his tail is moving quite vigorously. He's not enjoying them. Now, Jonathan, who's only 11 years old all the way from Alabama, you're wondering, what do I think this lion would do if I were to walk up towards him? Well, Jonathan, if I were to step out of the car right now, he'd get up and he'd run away. I'm almost certain about that. Look, at, He's going to do a big rollover now. And the reason for this is first I'm going to give him a fright. Oh, that smells so terrible. <laughs> we need smell vision That needs to be created because then it will be a more real life safari, don't you think? Imagine sitting at your computer getting these smells. It would be wonderful. Um, so, so he would run away and if I maybe came from a distance, say I was doing a bushwalk with guests or I was out with, track, uh, with Herbie and we were tracking, and we were walking about he'd probably also get up and move slightly or he might start growling at us he won't just attack you he will tell you if he's unhappy with you but if you're going to give a lion a fright they're just like a normal house cat they, they will jump up and, and rush away so i'm not too worried about that but you should never just walk up to a lion especially a wild lion, any lion it doesn't matter if it's tame in inverted commas because i don't think there's any such thing as a tame lion or a tame tiger or leopard Think these animals you aren't able to domesticate isn't that beautiful so rather don't walk up to an animal that's why we've got the cars and they're habituated to the vehicles so that means that they're used to us they don't see us as food when you look at me like that though surely you don't have room for Sebastian and I in that belly of yours his skin can only stretch so much and I reckon that it's at the maximum stretching point now but lying on your back like that, that probably relieves some sort of, uh, or provides some comfort. I know that's the first thing that we do. You undo the top button of your pants, loosen your belt, and you lay on your back on the couch, and then you fall asleep after a big meal. 
but he's not a small lion. I really did forget how big these lions can honestly get. It's a very humbling experience. I always talk about being uh, feeling humbled around elephants, but you feel small and helpless when you're sitting only a couple of meters away from the greatest cat in Africa. Well, we'll stay with him for a little bit longer. Maybe he does another rollover or perhaps he twitches his ears. Very exciting. We're going to send you across now to Tristan, who's on the search for leopards. I am indeed, and I've lost my wavy locks now, and it feels quite breezy, actually. I've got a nice trim, and I would imagine that uh, some of the girls in summer would quite like to have no hair, because, gee, it was hot with all of that. But what we've come across now is quite interesting. Just here on my right-hand side, there's now tracks for a female leopard again. So we've now got different tracks. I'm not sure which female this could be. It's right up on the northern boundary, and I don't know if these tracks are from this morning or from last night it looks like from last night and the reason why i say that because i actually haven't gotten out the car to check it but i want to get out quickly just to make sure but the reason why i say it looks like it's from last night is that we had a bit of rain last night and these tracks have a bit of what we call pitting on top and so when you get a track that is made and rain comes rain has a soft little drop that falls down even soft rain and it will leave little sort of indents within the track and you can see this track is actually quite rough in places and so the rain was on top of it from last night so this is actually from last night and I would imagine that this could be Tundi's track this is the only leopard I would imagine would have come up here it's also a little bit too big for Shongile this morning when we saw Shongile her track in terms of how long it would have been if I put this little piece of grass there would probably be somewhere around that length all right so a little bit shorter than what we see with Tundi's track. It's also quite a big front paw for a female, so this is definitely from yesterday. The other way that we can tell whether it's fresh or not is if you touch the edges where the toe is, or anywhere where there's an, a ridge, these edges are quite sort of crispy and hard, so it's from where rain fell on top and the soft sort ofness of the soil when it got a bit of water on it, it dries a little harder and that's why it, give, it doesn't give when you touch it. If it gave, it would be a track that would be a little bit fresh and we'd know it was after the rain. But the interesting thing is we didn't find tracks for Tundi at all this morning that I could find. So I'm going to try and see if we can't follow these and see where they lead. I found the male tracks that I had in pre-show was from for Mvula. He came all the way up and then crossed north into Buffalo's Hook as we know. He was up near Hardakul this morning. So those are his tracks and my tracking saga continues. I don't think I've driven a road today without a leopard track being on it which is quite something and if we actually think of the number of leopards that we're tracking theoretically I mean we don't know for sure whose foot is for who other than Mvula and Tingana and potentially Shadow and Cub because we know that combination and Shongile because we followed from where the kill was but theoretically there is tracks here for seven different leopards we've got Shadow and Cub tracks that we had on Zoe's then we had Mvula's tracks going north we had Tingana's tracks with that female around Balanites, Rebecca's which I would imagine is Shadow's track then we had now Tundi's track um, who else have we had? How many is that? Oh, and then we had the young female track around the gate going west into Simbambili so that would make another one so I think my maths is correct it's Shadow, Mvula, Tingana Tani, Shongile, Shadow's Cub, and that mystery one up at the top. So seven different footprints that I've found just on Juma today, which shows you why leopards can be a nightmare. And of those seven, how many have we found? None. No good. Not to say we won't though, we are going to carry on trying and persevering and seeing if we can't find anything. I wonder if it's not worth just going back to where that kill was last night. You never know, maybe this leopard is hanging around that area and went to go and see scraps and just decided to have a little snooze in that section. It's not far from here, it's just in front and it would be probably a good place to go. Look, there's a nice big termite mound there with lots of shade and that is an ideal place for a leopard to spend its day resting before getting going later in the evening. And it's always good just to check the termite mounds and the trees at this time, especially when you're kind of looking for leopards. Termite mounds often are quite shady and you'll find that they sit on top in the shade and they can just get a sort of higher perspective of what's going on out here. Now I need to plug in my sound before Megan shouts at Craig and tells me to do it. Ooh. Trying to get this little jack in while driving is not exactly easy. 
but there we go that's better so a lot of you are wondering what the squeaky noise is that is on delightful Wendy well Wendy has some squeaks of her own secrets that we can't sort of figure out but I have no idea what the squeak is from I've looked everywhere and of course you know when you can't drive well when you're not driving the squeak goes away so you've got to now try and work it out by driving and listening for it but I think it's something to do with the fact that Wendy's bonnet doesn't actually close properly so it sits just on top and I think the bonnet bounces a little bit and squeaks but it's not my seat as far as I know maybe it is I just get used to it after a while I don't know why it's something that's kind of every day that you drive Wendy the first drive I did with her this week I was thoroughly irritated by the squeak and well now it's just part of driving Wendy really what do you think Craig now this area is supposed to be where the leopards would have been. They would have been just in those big knob thorns. But you can see there's a herd of impalas who don't really look too perturbed by life. They're obviously making a little bit of space between us and where they are, just in case there is a predator somewhere here with us. But they really aren't too flustered. They're not standing with their heads upright and not smelling the wind or trying staring in one direction. So they look as though they're pretty chilled. And for those of you who think impalas don't blend in, well, there you go. That's a picture right there. As you can see, they actually blend quite well. And it's very seldom a predator is going to walk up to a set of impalas like this in this proximity and not be seen. So their camouflage does actually work a little bit. And talking about camouflage, I would imagine Tinio lying flat in the grass must be quite camouflaged, with, although he's got a big fat belly from that zebra that he ate on Arethusa, and hopefully he hasn't passed or dropped any more darts while he's been with Taylor. He hasn't dropped any more darts, Tristan. <laughs> well, there we go. That is a very South African saying for you. I'm sure you can all work out what Tristan was referring to. In case you were wondering about the strange lingo that we normally will speak. There we go. That's one of the weird things that we say. Um, well, I'm actually quite happy, Tristan. He doesn't seem to be lying in too much grass. And Tenor, I must say thank you very much for that because it would have been very difficult to try and get a decent view of him if he was laying maybe just 50 meters to the left because there the grass is quite tall so this patch is quite quite good over here and then hopefully he'll just sit up for us you know we've had him rolling over now hopefully the next roll will be onto his haunches maybe he sits up does a stretch for us and then flops down again I'd be quite happy with that of course uh, most of you know it's very difficult to sit with a very flat cat especially one like this with such a large belly but again I'm so reluctant to get up and move because Murphy's law as soon as you do something like that well they get up they leave you and then you have no idea where they've disappeared to and we also don't know what his route is going to be that's going to be another challenging thing this afternoon is that if we do decide to bumble away and try and find some elephants or perhaps just some some general game we do run the risk of losing him so let's see we won't leave just yet we'll wait until another guide comes into the sighting and then it, they can at least babysit him i suppose for 20 minutes or so depending how long they can last with sleep with a sleeping cat and then we'll have to come in afterwards again but i don't think he'll move just yet i think he's still got a bit of time of resting before he does move. Now, Izzy, you're wondering about the young, um, the, sorry, the young Kahuma male. Um, you're wondering if he will join the Birminghams when he grows up. No, probably not, because he's going to be direct competition um, to the Birmingham boys. Remember, one of the males will be his father. We're not sure which one because both Tenure and Mfumo were seen mating with the various females well just as many times as the rest of the Birmingham <clears throat> sorry I got a little tickle in my throat there and um, so so no I don't think so he'll have to go off on his own hopefully the Nkuhumas have some more cubs and then he might be lucky otherwise he's gonna have to go off on his own which won't be very good remember if he is on his own the chances that he's going to make it are, are less but if he's got some buddies with him that can help protect his will help protect what was I going to say watch over his shoulder that's what I actually wanted to say but the words came out of my mouth way too quickly then they have a better chance I was discussing it very briefly this morning how difficult it is for young males to move about 
while they're still young and not able to control a territory of their own they have to be very careful i've seen many instances where younger boys get chased out without really a fight you know the big dominant males will just come in they'll come in very loud roaring trying to act as big and scary as they can because they also don't want to get into an unnecessary battle because if they get injured they could potentially die so it's a it's a tough one but it's nice to see them i think it's just amazing how these birmingham boys are constantly on the move and they've got quite a large piece of land that they do move around on. i mean they traverse on Simbambili, they traverse on Arethusa, Little Gauri, Hoffmans, Chitwa, Annettes, Cheetah Plains, all the way down Cheetah Plains, Torchwood, Biffles Hook, Juma of course, Chitwa, did I say Chitwa? They're all over this area and sometimes they even pop into the Kruger National Park. That is a massive area and I suppose that's why these males have to split up like they do. Is because if they don't do that they would never be able to completely travel their territory and make sure that there's no intruders coming through just trying to think are there any i'm not you see i'm not familiar with the the prides of lions in the western sands unfortunately that's tristan's forte so perhaps you can go when you guys see tristan again you can ask the question maybe final control can put a question through to tristan from me and ask him who he thinks the next up and coming male lions will be that will push the Birmingham's out. It's obviously a little bit, oh, I suppose it's never really early because anything can happen. A, a coalition could come from Kruger, could come from the Manuleti, come barging in and take the Birmingham's out at any time. But maybe Tristan will have a better idea as to who could push up this way. Like I said, I know a lot of potential lion coalitions in the south. Check there, Seb, there's a kudu. Can you see it? All the way down there, we'll have a look, seen as our lion sleeping, there's a family of kudu that have just gone into the thicket. There should be more than just one of them. You go. Oh, there they are, just to the right of that big tree, just moving down there. So typically there won't just be one, kudu are quite gregarious, so they live in family groups. Now you're lucky that you're walking the other way, miss, because you don't obviously know that there's a lion here. She, she's upwind from this male lion, so she won't even be able to smell him. Somebody got a fright. I think the kudu scared the F Franklins because the Franklins are now all alarming around there. But he's not reacting at all. Look at that. He hasn't even bothered to open his eyes to respond to that sound. But he's listening. But if something were to come walking up here, that would be quite nice for us. Because I think he would try and take it down anyway. And this is also the area Herbie was... We were having a chat with Herbie today. Obviously, he was out helping us track and he didn't come across any anything obviously he was hot on the heels of this male lion and we were just in front of him and he thought that those leopard tracks were actually coming in this direction too and then we heard monkeys just towards the end of drive alarming just south from where we are now around twin dams so maybe those leopards the male and female those tracks that herbie was on and tristan were uh, on this morning maybe they're just there in the uh, in the mulwati somewhere but we'll listen out if we do hear anything, there's lots of kudu actually moving in that area. Come this way, come kudu. If only I could do the kudu call. Oh, no, no, sorry, hang on, sorry everybody. Megan, the director, she was just talking to me very quickly. No, Megan, um, those monkeys were from the end of drive this morning. We told her Herbie about them that we heard them alarming, it sounded like maybe in the Mulwati, maybe south of Spaghetti Junction. I did tell Herbie, and I think he went to try and have a look around there, but he didn't have much luck during the day, so if you can just tell Tristan that. Tristan got very excited, I think, <laughs> when I said monkey's alarming, because obviously he's got leopards on the brain, and that's all he wants to do, is he wants to find a spotted cat. Well, speaking of the man searching for cats, well, we've got one. We'll stay with uh, Tenor for a little bit longer and I'll send you across to Tristan to see if he's got anything further to tell you. 
Well, no, not really. I, I mean, we checked around where that carcass was. There's still no sign there. Lots of tracks for the leopards from yesterday, which is much what I thought. And I'm pretty sure that the tracks that I did see just now are from yesterday as well. So, not really too fresh. But I'll carry on checking around and see what we can find. In the meantime, though, we found something that a leopard would love to hunt. There's young Nyala. There's an adult female on the left and then her calf, I would say, on the right. So, it must be her little one. It's right up against her. And... It looks like a little female because it hasn't gotten that brownish coloration yet. And normally about that size they would have already started to get horns and would have started to change color slightly. There is a younger male here somewhere. I don't know where he's gone but he is somewhere around. Uh, there he is. And you can see his hair is starting to get a little bit longer and there's those little horns coming out and already around his neck. Notice how the coloration is starting to change. So he's starting to become a lot more dark brown and getting fluffy as opposed to his mom or the sister or his niece or whatever it would be that is with him over there. But there are exquisite animals. Look at those stripes and dots. And I hear some squirrels alarm calling to my left. I might go and investigate those just now. Although the Nyala look as though they are not too perturbed by this at all. And squirrels are not the most reliable when it comes to alarm calls. Squirrels will alarm call at leopard, but they'll also alarm call at other squirrels. They'll alarm call at birds of prey. They'll alarm call at anything really. So they're not the best ones. If we had monkeys with the squirrels and Franklins, then you can start to really work it out and know that there is something around. But the Nyala themselves look fine. And there's a little diker behind me that just ran off so it seems as though there's lots of other antelope species which would indicate no leopards in this area. Now you might be wondering what has happened to Mr. James Henry and why we haven't seen him for the last little bit. Well, Mr. James Henry is trying to take cover from the deluge that has just hit them in the Mara. They have a massive hailstorm busy raining down there and causing them to run for cover. So James is just trying to avoid the storm and trying to get to an area where he can just get his rain covers on and get out of hail. It's one thing to be in heavy rain, but in hail does a lot of damage, particularly even to our canvas covers and things like that. And we don't want James to get a hailstone to the head, so he's just trying to seek some shelter until that passes. And I'm sure they'll be back with us in the next little bit. It's so strange to think because just now when Megan told me that James is in a hailstorm, I have to do a sort of double take because, you know, we go from the situation here where it's dry and dusty to a hailstorm in the Mara and there's a beautiful big male Nyala. It amazes me how different they are. They look like a completely different species to the females that we've just seen further back and it's amazing to think that young little male that looks like the females will eventually turn into that in the next three years. That's how long it's going to take him to start looking like that male does. Watch the camouflage as he goes in there. Just disappears in seconds. Amazing. Ah, what a beautiful afternoon as well. It's not too windy, the sun is out from this morning where we had this overcast cloudy day to this afternoon. It really is very pleasant and so hopefully the animals will come out and decide to show themselves this afternoon, in particular the spotted cats. Although we do know that most of the cats that we have tracked today, we at least know where they've gone. So we know Mvula went north, we know whichever female it was by the gate went into Simbambili, we know that Shongile went into Arethusa, which is the furthest west I've ever seen her tracks go since I've been here. It's not to say that she didn't get taken there when mom was around, but it's the furthest I've seen. And then we know that Shadows and Cubs tracks were right near the western boundary, and so the possibility of that cub jumping over into Arethusa is also quite good. And then Tandi and Tumba and Shadow and Tingana, I'm not so sure where they are. What also interests me is that this morning we were kind of saying Tingana and I know that he crossed into Juma last night and there was lots of vocalizing for Leopard. But I wonder if maybe some of the tracks we were following this morning, given just how big Tumba's foot is, is if he wasn't maybe with Tandi this morning and was walking around and we keep thinking it's Tingana. I know that even myself I tracked what I thought was Tingana the other day and it turned out to be Tumba so it's possible that maybe he's walking around with Tandi and we're getting a little confused by all of this and Shadow and Cub have actually shifted more to the west and then Tandi has come back this way because the last tracks we had for that male and female was coming down this way towards the Mulawati and then Taylor had those monkeys alarm calling so that is exactly where Tumba and Tandi often do walk these days and wouldn't surprise me at all if they were in that area 
but I have driven slowly this afternoon and checked very nicely for any sort of signs of and stopped and listened for any alarm calls and so far nothing like I say Herbie also spent the day out and he didn't find too many signs so hopefully it'll be a little bit later that things will start to move and we'll start to see what's going on So Bobby, monkeys will alarm call actually for a multitude of different animals. Oh, sorry, Franklins. I was too busy looking in the tree above there. But they'll alarm call for a multitude of different animals. So they'll alarm call for birds of prey, they'll alarm call for snakes, they'll alarm call for lion, leopard, and varying other predators. And there's some guys that have studied this that they reckon that the monkeys have a completely different alarm call for the different predators. So some predators have slightly different tones and clicks and sounds. I personally can't hear it, but I have worked with one or two trackers that say as soon as they hear it, no, that's a lion or a leopard or a snake. And they generally were quite right. So if you have that ear to be able to pick up those sounds you could actually work out what these monkeys are shouting about it really is quite amazing now our franklins have just run across they were crested franklins for those of you keeping a bird list most of you should have that one on your bird list unless you are new to safari live in which case well i'm glad we can add one if they just ran across the road quickly unfortunately so i weren't able to put them on camera for too long Let's see if Giraffe Dip has anything for us this afternoon. Hmm. Laura, you're asking about Vitormi and whether we've heard anything. To be honest, I have not heard a single thing about him since we've been off Cheetah Plains. I very seldom go onto the Eastern Channel these days and I, I will ask and I will try and see if I can't get an update for you this afternoon and just see if anybody has seen him in recent times. I know he was still hanging around in Koro in that area, but I haven't heard any recent, recent updates on him or about him in the last few weeks. I will though try and investigate a little bit further. This is changing from leopards a little bit. I know Taylor was saying that she's not sure which coalition will take over from the Birminghams or try and push the Birminghams but I think it's a bit difficult. We don't really know what lies on our fringes. We don't know what's in the Kruger Park side that could potentially be coming our way. What I will say is that there are no reports of any large coalitions pushing through into the Manuleti that are big enough to challenge the four Birmingham males. The Majingalans in the far west of the reserve are getting a bit on the older side now and I highly doubt with just the three of them that they'll be able to take on four much younger Birmingham boys. That, so they are really out of the picture. The three Solala males, again much younger than the Birmingham boys, don't think that they're really going to challenge them too much. They seem to be pushing further south. There is a coalition of five males that comes in from the Sand River but they seem to be the fringe of their territory is here and the chances of them coming all the way up from the southern Sabi sands to where we are is probably sort of negligible. I don't think we'll see too much of them from this side. So who knows what there is inside Kruger, but at this stage the Birminghams are sitting pretty. There's not very much in the way of challenges that could potentially kind of come and push them out of this area. What they need to be careful of is of being so much on their own because what can happen with them is that you have a situation like Tinio today is by himself and those three Solala males or three Majingalans or three young males or two young males come across a lone male like that and they can inflict serious injuries and there could be a big problem so that's where they need to be a bit careful they spend so much time apart that they need to be a bit concerned about that if somebody comes in here they might get caught short the thing is though is that they're not hearing any vocalizing they're not picking up scent marking so why not be spread apart there's no one really challenging and that makes life a lot easy so we'll see when challenges do come how they respond to that I would imagine if we do start to see other lions coming into this area the Birmingham boys will be a lot more together than what they are currently now I'm just driving on hyena road because well I haven't driven on hyena road and I don't know how long in probably about two months and so I thought I'll just come and have a little look you never know some of these roads when you haven't driven them for a while can hold little secrets and little sort of hidden gems and always worth having a little look around but I do wonder where these leopards have ended up and how they've sort of moved and where they've gone I did try to get hold of the guys in the west to find out if anyone actually found Shongile but no one answered me which was a bit disappointing I was hoping that somebody would have said yes we saw her or not because her tracks this morning were very very fresh and we must have missed her by I would say half an hour latest 
have her going across into Arethusa, which is a bit of a disappointment. But interesting that she's starting to venture so far from where she was and I'm not sure if anyone actually knows of her being on that side. I certainly in the time that I was at Simamili didn't once hear of Karula taking Shongile or Sana into Arethusa. I'm not sure if maybe some of you that were watching at that time managed to see her going that side with Karula but I don't think so. I, last time I remember Karula being that side was when they went down just into the southern part of Arethusa where they used to go about um, sort of zebra drive and that southern corner in the southwestern corner of Juma. I don't remember them ever coming far north towards the Simamili Arethusa cut line. And the other thing about Hyena Road is it's going to take us towards Biffles Hook Dam. So hopefully there'll be some ellies there. I've really missed the elephants. I have still have not seen an elephant herd in about a month since I in fact actually longer five weeks this is the last sort of elephant herd that I had on Chitra and so I was hoping that we'd find a herd here somewhere and be able to spend some time with the elephants I do miss them we had that sort of purple patch for a while where there was elephants everywhere and I know a lot of you are still asking about Fang and whether we know anything about her or what's happened to her and well the thing is, is that she, we haven't seen her. Nobody that I know of has seen her. I've, I've asked around and no one has. But the thing is, is that you must remember that the time that we saw Fang, we were seeing her herd every sort of two, three days for about four or five weeks they were around. And so what happens with elephants, particularly herds and, and large females and large herds like that, is that they move quite a bit and they'll have a large home range. You can find that she'll go all the way into Kruger, deep into the Kruger, and then she'll come back this way. She'll go down to the Sabi River, the Sand River, maybe even up as far as the Olifants River. And so they move around quite a bit. And she does, let's say, four weeks here at Juma, and then she goes down to the Sand River and she spends another four weeks there then she goes down to the Sabi River and another four weeks there and it could be three months until she ends up coming back this side so there's no reason to worry just yet about her and not to be too concerned I'm sure one of these days we are going to see her coming back and the drier it gets the better it actually is for us because here we have a lot of man-made water which holds water through the winter season the rivers are going to start getting lower and the impact in that area is going to be huge and you're going to find then the ellies are going to start pushing further afield and we'll find them in these areas at some point and we're going to get exactly like what we had a big flux of elephants coming in and I'm pretty sure she'll be one of those and we will see her again so that's my kind of hopefulness about it I don't think that she is in any way in distress somewhere or has died because we would have heard about it an elephant carcass is not a small object and not something that just kind of disappears or goes unnoticed so we would have definitely heard if she had died or if she had fallen foul of her Okay, so we don't need to stress too much at this stage. Now I'm going to head off to Buffalzook Dam because Hyena Road didn't have any surprises or any little gifts for me. And why do that? Miss McCurdy, I believe, has left her smelly tinio friend and is now on an expedition around Juma. Let's see what she plans to do. Well, speaking of elephants, it seems as though you were talking about Fang, I think that's what we're going to try and look for, is just some elephants. But I agree with everything that Tristan has, has said about Fang. I don't think there's any need to worry. Elephants do just not disappear, but they move into other areas and feed for weeks and weeks, sometimes even months, before they decide to come back this way. Perhaps her herd has discovered the wonderful lush vegetation along the sand on the Sabi River and she's just feasting away before she has to come back to some of this unpalatable stuff up in the north but what we're going to do now is we're on Weaver's Nest we did leave Tinyol fast asleep he rolled over one more time and that's all the action we got from him we won't stay away for too long though we'll maybe go back in about half an hour so I thought we'd go down along Gary Main perhaps we quickly go up Ledwood Road and maybe along Mamba or back Lear Road and see if we can't find some elephants because we did have some elephant activity around there from last night there's a Dacre bouncing in the bush it's not I think it's moving too quickly for us goodness gracious those animals can run quickly nice no, unfortunately gone too far away down there oh no there it is I'm gonna go <laughs> I can't sorry Sam Rusty this is all your fault why I couldn't show anybody the Dacre 
I'm going to reverse the car, so I can go back quick enough. And you know what Dacre are like? They, um, um, they basically just, what do they just do? They pause, stop, have a look at you, and then they completely run in the opposite direction. So that's exactly what happened just then. But uh, Roshni, you've said, what about some birding? I'm always keen for a good birding session. Let's look, Roshni, what are we going to find first? We didn't actually see a black-headed oriole not too long ago. Let's see if we can maybe find another one. I reckon we're going to see a go-away bird first. What bird do you think we're going to see first, Seb? like to play this game. Just in general, yeah. First bird we're going to see would be... I win. <laughs> Go away bird just on top of the tree. I was cheating because I actually saw it and then decided that wasn't fair of me. Sorry Sebastian, that wasn't very good sportsmanship. But that's exactly it. My family would be so disappointed in me if they heard me doing that cheating. The only game that I ever cheat in is Monopoly and I play Banker and then just help myself to a few extra notes. And if you're saying, tsk 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 Taylor, don't even start telling stories because I know every single person that has been the banker in that game has helped themselves to fake money. <laughs> That's the only time. Megan, Alice, have you ever done that before? I'll ask the directors. But Roshni, that bird is for you. That's the go away bird. Oh yes, Megan also makes up words um, for, very, for 30 seconds. We play a lot of board games in camp. So that's quite funny. But there sits a go away bird at the top of a knob thorn. Oh, careful. Hopping about. There's not much to eat on this knob thorn just yet. No little pods that it can feed on. I think that's what it's searching for though. There's some tasty morsels. But unfortunately, you're going to have to find another tree now. It's just cleaning its beak on the branch. Oh, looks like it's settling in for a moment there, just having a rest. Oh, look at that. That's quite pretty. The wind between its feathers on its tail. The interesting position. Maybe it's holding on tight. Perhaps it's worked out if it sits lower down on the branch, it won't get blown away as much. That's so funny. Your crest, your tail, all blowing in the wind there, bird. You'd think you'd choose a different tree to sit on. Maybe it's enjoying, maybe it's getting its hair done, the equivalent of getting its feathers done. Is the tease look still in? I'm not sure. But I think that's the look that it is going for. Right, let's see what else we can find. We have a quick scan around here. Find any more birds? Should be some. We should see a dove on the road or a crested Franklin. Something along those lines. Right, no. Not even a starling waiting for us. Sorry about that. We'll go and find some more. Tristan has finally arrived at Bivelzook Dam. I wonder if the hippo are there popping their nostrils just above the water. Well, Taylor, you would think this would be the case, but alas, our hippos are being, well, full of nonsense and are not popping their heads up at all. You can see where it's actually traveling in the water. You can see sort of line and a bow way. And there we go. Just popped his head up. So this is the big male at Buffelzook Dam. And he's being a bit shy this afternoon. He keeps dropping down underneath the water and then moving. And you can see another one's actually coming in the distance from further afield. I wonder if it's another male. Look, listen. I wonder if we're going to get a little showdown between these two. Looks like another male further across and you can see they're both heading straight towards each other with quite a bit of speed. If you ever thought hippos moved slowly in water, then you can see there how quickly they do. They even sort of push a bow wave as they go. I'm going to move a little closer just so we can be in the right place if there is a little bit of action that does start. Hopefully we will see these two sort of squaring off a bit because watching hippos fighting is often quite something they can get pretty violent with one another and the show of power and the display of sheer strength is phenomenal to watch so now uh, we'll just see now he seems to not be getting too close just yet there's a little bit of splashing going on as you can see a little bubble blowing and this is all just techniques to try and intimidate what's going on and I see a poor terrapin is being washed out of the way there as well you can just see it floating off to the side its head just went underneath now there it goes. So that was cast aside as this hippo lunged forward and a big wave went 
crashing, and poor little Terrapin <laughs> didn't know what hit it. It was almost as though it's gone into the surf zone now, and having to deal with that. The other hippo seems to be quite submissive. You can see it's turned its body. It's not in any way responded to that vocal call that this male made. It's just sitting there and watching, and it looks a lot smaller. I wouldn't know if it's not a female or a very young male. And if it is a young male, it's not going to go after after this male. They're going to probably sit for a bit and just kind of deal with it and hope that the sun sets quickly and it can then get out of here and find some other water sources. And we're going to find a lot of competition between these hippos as time goes on because the waters in these areas are starting to dry and so space for lots of young hippos is drying up and they then have to compete with these bigger guys in these water holes and unfortunately take risks to try and stay hydrated and stay all sort of in water and keep out of the sun. Now a lot of you say you love the sound that a hippo makes. Isn't it the best? It's just one of those quintessential African sounds. There's a few. There's the lion roar, there is definitely the fish eagles and hippos for me is another one. When you hear hippos you kind of know you're in Africa and you know that you're in some area where there's beautiful scenery because there's water and I love that sound that they make so it's very cool to hear. So, Michael, you want to know if hippos eat meat. Michael, hippos, in the rule, sort of general rule, is that they don't. It's 99% of the time they won't. But every now and then there has been reported cases where they have mouthed and tasted and kind of looked as though they're feeding on carcasses. Whether they've actually swallowed is anyone's guess, but they definitely do pick up carcasses in their mouths from time to time. And it's generally in a time when there is very little food around. So you'll find in drought systems like last year, it would have been recorded hippos going up to carcasses and sniffing around and smelling. And you might find they're getting a deficiency nutrients from their vegetarian diet that they normally have and they then go and feed off that just to try and complement it at the very sort of worst case scenario but it's seldom 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 seen or recorded it's pretty much that they're mostly vegetarian so they'll move around at night feeding off big clumps of grass they have a poor digestive system much the same as what you'll see from something like an elephant and they have to move around and feed off quite a bit of vast quantities and the reason why they do it at night as opposed to during the day is because as you can see there's no hair on their body so they've got a very sort of soft skin much like us as people and that means that they dehydrate and burn very very easily and that means that they've got to move around rather at night than during the day and risk being dehydrated by the sun's rays because they have to feed for such long periods of time because of that bad digestive system and that's why they've adapted to become a semi-aquatic animal, one of the only true semi-aquatic mammals that we have in terms of the big ones in Africa. And I think all is calmed down now, not too much of a stress at this stage. Everyone seems to be falling asleep. asleep. So mischief hippos do live fairly long, so they'll live to about 35 years old, 30 to 35, which is quite a long time. When we have times like we did last year with droughts, then you'll find that the life expectancy would have lowered a little bit, would have had a lot of hippos that would have died, particularly older hippos, so hippos that were in their late 20s, early 30s, may, would have, maybe wouldn't have reached where they would have gotten had we had a year of very wet weather, because the conditions would have meant that they got emaciated and dehydrated, and they, being older, would have succumbed to that. So generally, though, we'd say 30 to 35 years is an average lifespan for a hippo. So quite long-lived, if we think of other animals, and if you think about people, if it wasn't for modern day medicine then we as people would have had about an average lifespan of something similar so it's quite interesting just to see we might have been a little bit longer closer to 40 years but generally without medicine we wouldn't survive nearly as long as we do but you can see it's all sort of calm now there's no more running about and pushing bow waves and noise <laughs> so Terry, you say, how do we tell male and female from just a head sticking out of the water? Well Terry, the males are infinitely larger than the females. So this guy that's closest to us that you see there, just the back of his head, there's a very large distance between his eyes, big bulky head. And when we first arrived, his head was right out of the water. So I could see the dimensions and the size of his head. And that's how we know that he's a big male. Females don't get quite as big. Look at the size there. You can see big nostrils and a long distance between the eyes and the nostrils and bulky sort of neck area. The one on the other side is a little bit more difficult. I would actually sort of be a bit scared to take a 100% 
guess as to male or female. I think it's a young male, just given its sort of behavior and the way that it is. Also, generally with females, you'll find them in small groups together. So you'll find sort of two or three females or three or four females together, and they tend to hang around quite a lot and are far more sort of cozy in terms of their company. They'll stay right next to one another. Whereas this looks like a young hippo by itself, and then a bigger male that's territorially dominant over this that has come and as soon as that big male saw that hippo it came rushing over to the side and just to say to you stay right there this is my area not yours and keep it at bay so that's how we kind of tell male and female but it is very difficult when they're younger sort of sub-adult males and adult females they can all look exactly the same hip sexing of hippos is one of the most difficult animals to sex out here along with hyenas actually so not easy but that's why we are calling it a male on the right but this guy closest to us is just too big to be anything else so Justin the top speed of a hippo outside of the water as compared to in the water is is a little bit faster on land well, given that they don't have to push large sort of masses of water out their way but in water they'll do about 20 to 25 kilometers an hour which in miles is about 16 15 16 am i right there craig somewhere around there mass is not my strong point maybe megan you can tell me what it is and then on land they'll do about 10 kilometers faster than that so they can do close to about 35 kilometers on land so quick is the answer much quicker than you think in water you would think that they'd be much slower and you can try and swim at 25 kilometers an hour and see how just how fast that is you probably won't reach that at all so 35 kilometers 21 miles so around 20 miles an hour on land and then like I say on on water it would be a little bit less than that so about 14 maybe if I'm not mistaken I might be a bit wrong like I say maths is not my strong point and well that's just the way it goes really unfortunately now both our hippos are underwater so we're going to carry on there's no ellies or signs of ellies no fresh tracks which is a bit disappointing I was hoping to find some sort of signs of them so I'm gonna now check around Nyala Road north and then Nyala Road south and maybe down towards Chitwa Dam and see if there's anything there and while we do that I believe Taylor has got a mystery something that she wants to show all of us It's another kingfisher. It's a brown hooded kingfisher again. I know we saw one this morning and I was saying to you how difficult they always are to put on screen. But here we go. And it's, this is a much better version of the kingfisher because it's in lovely light too. And there's also a bird calling. It's not the kingfisher. Let's have a little listen. I'm going to play a quiz now. So I want to know from you what bird is calling at the moment. That's an easy one. You should all get that very, very, very quickly. Now, I think that this is a female brown hooded kingfisher. There's very little sexual dimorphism between the two, but typically the female has sort of got brown coverts on her wings where her shoulder, you can't see a bird's shoulder, but we'll just use that term loosely would be, and the male tends to have black. So you can see that it's quite light in color over there and that's really the only difference between the two it's um it's actually quite difficult to tell them apart otherwise and they're fairly common throughout the whole of south africa so we're discussing its diet this morning and we're talking about how they eat the fish and tadpoles as well as and predominantly insects but sometimes they'll take lizards too i've, I've never seen a a kingfisher catching a lizard before well a brown hood kingfisher in particular but that's something definitely on the agenda imagine catching a rainbow skink how beautiful that would be to see something like that and we quite nice I suppose they'd eat chameleons then too not great for the chameleon but what a spectacular sighting that would be it's one thing seeing southern ground hornbills um, fishing chameleons out of a tree but to have a kingfisher do that would be something really quite amazing it's looking, it's staring. I wonder if it's going to go in for the kill. It's looking right down on the ground. See how it keeps bobbing its head every now and then. It's obviously hungry. Hoping to catch one or two last meals before the sun goes down. Oof. 
Now, Pea Heart, you've said that the bird that was calling was perhaps a wood dove. You got the dove part right, but not a wood dove. Manushk, you've said a Cape Turtle Dove. Ding, 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 ding. Woo! You win the prize. There's no prize, of course, but well done for getting the answer correct. I was just checking to make sure that there was actually somebody watching and I wasn't just talking to myself here, so that's good. Now we need to go underneath this wonderful tunnel that has been created by a bush willow, so we shall go underneath. And the gremlins have been so good this afternoon. They had a stern talking to. Hopefully they don't attack us because I know that this is a gremlin spot. But we'll go out of it very quickly, Megan. I'm going to fly through here. Oh, oh, that's very cool. I don't know if this kingfish is going to fly away. It probably is. Ah, oh, no, that would have been amazing. It would have been even an even better view. Oh, it's actually flown even closer. No, no, it's been spotted. It's worked out that we've spotted it. It's not having any of that. That's fine. It's sat still enough for long enough. <laughs> Don't mind me while I just get, try and get the car into gear. <laughs> oh, goodness. Rusty. Rusty gives us grey hairs. But she also brings us lots of smiles to our face too. Oh my goodness. Now Vicky, you're wondering how old are Wendy and Rusty? I'm not exactly sure, but I think they're close to about 20 years at least. So they're old cars, but they, they do last for a very long time. They're well made, they're strong. Um, so they probably go for a bit longer. I, actually, I'm trying to see if... <laughs> I was going to check the odometer to see how many kilometers that they have on them. Can't find anything though. That, that one doesn't work anymore, but luckily we don't need to worry about how many kilometers on these cars. They're well past their service history. They just get serviced every few months, especially because we drive them quite hard. So they don't necessarily put a lot of kilometers on the clock. I reckon that a vehicle this old being used as a, a game drive vehicle probably only has maybe 180,000, maybe 200,000 kilometers on the clock with so many years. Because if you think about it, on average, some days we don't drive them at all, some days we maybe do 5 kilometers, some days we do 20 kilometers, if even that. And on our traverse, I don't know if we can quite sort of do more than about 20 kilometers in one game drive, but we also don't need to because there's often so many different things. So, so yeah, so they go forever, but shame, we work, we work that engine hard, obviously off-roading, oh wow. As soon as we're doing birding, there's a beautiful lilac-breasted roller and in this light it is so gorgeous. Oh, it's a pity it didn't land closer because that would have been so special. But it's all the way down there. You've got it, Seb. There it is. There we go. Just sitting beautifully. Now, can you please hop to the branch to the left so you don't have that marula stick in your face because that doesn't look very nice. But they are lovely birds. They are the most colourful bird that we see out here on a regular basis. Obviously, the gorgeous bushrike is a contender the most beautiful bird and uh, one that we don't see a purple crested turaco that would be very nice to see because those are lovely interesting looking birds I have also have another question maybe you can help me out have you ever seen a purple crested turaco on the show you can hashtag safari live if you have indeed seen one and we'll have a look at them a little bit later let's continue let's see what else is out and about but another one that likes to eat insects just as just as the, um, what bird did we just look at? The brown hooded kingfisher does. Well, it seems as though the Mara team were battling off the rain, perhaps thunder and lightning. However, James has managed to muster up some courage and he's facing uh, the horrible weather. Let's go and see how he's doing. Well, we certainly haven't escaped it, everybody. We ha did have to do a big runner. Isn't that a wonderful picture that Fergus is creating for you there? The wind in the forefront of this sort of a storm is coming towards us. We got stuck twice and Fergus said to me, don't worry, after we escaped the first time, he said it's going towards the escarpment. Uh, we'll be fine here. You can stop. Let's get a shot. Well, you can see the escarpment. There's bone dry. And uh, the storm that you can see is covering the area that we just drove through at high speed. 
Isn't that an impressive arrangement of clouds? I think that's quite special. Anyway, it is dumping a phenomenal amount of water down to the south. Now, of course, for the migration, we are looking at giraffe, by the way, which is not part of the migration. This is a, a, an interesting development. As we got up to this point where we are now, we found a couple of thousand zebra, and they were accompanied by a few hundred wildebeest. So it looked like perhaps the front runners of a migration herd of sorts. But if this rain continues down to the south, I suspect it's going to be a little while still before we see the herds come up here. And if you are hearing a whole lot of rain, uh, wind, sorry, not rain, uh, that is because it is, uh, well, windy. Uh, is quite a lot of storm on the way. Yes, Izzy, you say, yay, tipple skirchy love, absolutely, much tipple skirchy love going on here as we wait for the storm to either sort of dissipate where it is now or, I suspect, come towards us. We're not going to hang around here a tremendously long time. I was hoping to spend a lot of time down south with the wildebeest. But I will tell you that I found, I think, probably the same tree-climbing lion that Scott had a little bit earlier, and we'll see if we can't go and find her again before we head back. We don't have to go back just yet. But while we do that, let's head across to Tristane. I believe that he is looking for leopards. Well, James, I was, but now I'm just puttering about, hoping leopards will look for me, because it seemed to work yesterday for us, and I suppose we're in credit with the leopards, because they are nowhere to be found today. And just checked here in the Mulawati, no sign of them there. Seems like wherever they are, they've grown wings and decided to fly to wherever they wanted to go. Now I'm going to head towards Cheetah Cut Line side. Come on, car. Of course, Wendy's turning circle is not a very good at all in comparison to Rusty. It is actually much better than when I went on leave. Hang on, what are all these tracks here? Don't tell me there's going to be more leopard tracks because, like I said, I've seen leopard tracks everywhere today. No, those are not leopard tracks. But Wendy's turning circle is probably about that of a 16 wheeler truck at the moment she really doesn't turn very well compared to rusty so it's taken a bit of getting used to but it is better since ali had a little sort of oopsie with wendy and a steering arm was replaced since then it seems to be turning a little bit better so all is good So, Skywalker, you're wondering what is the rarest animal that is found in this park? Um, hmm, I, I suppose we're talking about mammals is, is maybe what you're asking because there's probably incredibly rare insects here that, well, I don't even know about to be honest, but there are insects that we find here and during the summer months that James, myself, and Steph, and Brent, and Jamie had no idea what they were. So we do get rare ones like that, but in terms of mammals, I would say the rarest one probably, and this might be a contentious debate, but I would say it's probably a caracal. That's the one that we don't see much of at all. Um, we also have very rare animals in the pangolin and the aardvark. Both of those are not seen very much. The thing is about aardvarks is they actually hear a lot more than what we see them. We find a lot of their tracks pretty much every morning you go out you'll find a road where there's an aardvark track somewhere. So they're around it's just that we don't see them but in terms of just low numbers I would say caracal in this sort of area is a very difficult one to find. There's very few of them. In fact in my time in the Sabri Sands I've never seen one. Taylor was lucky enough to get, I think it's the first one ever on live drive this year on Cheetah Plains she saw one. I'm not sure if anybody else has ever seen one on Wild Earth Drives or on Safari Live so interesting from that point of view but I would say they're probably the rarest. I've seen both pangolins and aardvark quite a few times luckily enough but not the caracal so for me that's the rarest mammal that we see of the sort of more noticeable ones there's also certain bat species that are quite rare here mouse species but those are 
sort of very difficult because they're so small you won't really be able to find them very often and the thing with the mouse is it runs across the road and gone you won't see it so in terms of things that are actually able to see and we're able to show you caracal is probably the worst one from that point of view I'm super surprised that there's no LE tracks. So the LEs seem to be absolutely sort of nowhere at the moment. I was very surprised that we haven't seen any tracks. I haven't found any fresh footprints today. It seems that there is not one elephant anywhere on Juma at the moment, which is very strange. It's been a long time since we've had a situation like that. So I'm hoping that the LEs will start to come back and start to head back into this area I do miss them it's always nice when we've got lots of Ellie's around there such a joy to spend time around there sort of spend lots of hours playing and they go to water and they drink and there's quite a tight bond between all of them so they're a special animal in that regard now John you wondering what defines a mammal so mammals are warm-blooded animals so unlike things like reptiles that are cold-blooded they are warm-blooded and for the most part give birth to live young they do not lay eggs or anything like that and so that is kind of generally the easiest way to say a mammal so a warm-blooded creature that we see mostly most of the mammals you'll find are based on the ground but there are ones that do fly like the bats they are warm-blooded as well and that's just the easiest way to explain what a mammal is Craig what do you think where should we go left or right or straight come on Craig you want to go left Craig okay we'll go left no 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 you said left got to go with your first instinct Craig you can't change it now Left is where we're going. It's kind of where I wanted to go anyway, so we're in sync here, Craig. We are two minds alike working together, apparently. Now I'm glad to hear that Mr. James Henry is fine and didn't receive an ice ball to the noggin, because that would be quite anal, and with no hair on his head, it would definitely have caused quite a bit of damage and would not have been a very pleasant, although he's got that fancy new hat now and that tough leather would have protected that head and made sure that he didn't get any sort of damage from a flying ball of ice. Now, we're here in the Sabi Sands, no flying balls of ice raining down from this area, so let's go across to Miss McCurdy who can wave her golden locks, as we were talking about earlier, in the nice sunshine without having to worry about bits of ice falling on her head. Trying to show you my golden locks, but it's not really working. Now, Tristan, how on earth do you know that James has a new hat? Are you watching the show and presenting at the same time? That's some serious multitasking. Is it? Is it the crocodile dandy hat that James now has? Is that the one that he's talking about, Megan? Ah, okay. Then never mind. He's probably seen lots of pictures of it. <laughs> but yes, it is a very nice hat that James has. And Jamie, does Brent have one? I can't remember seeing Brent's having one of those. I feel like though, when you um, go to Kenya, there's a certain look though that you need to uh, keep up with, and that's of course the crocodile dandy hat. And Brent's, what is it? Is it a kokoi? What are those things called that he, Brent always wears? Something like that. <gasps> Waterbuck. Went into reverse the first time. Look through there. Oh, now they're all running away. Never mind, there were some water buck, but they're hiding behind the bushes, so it's not as easy to see them now. But they're feeding in this drainage line. There's impala too. Those are the ones that you can see now. And the reason why they're feeding down in the drainage line, because it has been quite windy through most of the day. So they're getting shelter, and they're finding nice, delicious, nice, delicious vegetation. Now, both Tristan and I have been searching for elephants all afternoon. It seems as though we're not having much luck in the sands, but let's go across to James with his fancy hat and a herd of elephants. There is a beautiful elephant, and yes, Taylor, I do have a fancy hat. It's fancier than yours, and you'll just have to live with that. <laughs> 
Isn't that pretty? I'm sitting in amongst the grass there. I'll tell you that the storm is still coming up, but we're rather closer to home than we were before, and so I'm not that terrified of it at the moment. You may also still be able to hear the odd winding noise, and that winding noise, of course, is the forerunner of the storm. Um, if we can pan, if you don't mind, Fergus, to the right-hand side, you will see that this clearing is actually very full of elephants. Lots and lots of them. I'm going to have to move the car, Ferg. Sorry, there's somebody trying to get past us. Sorry about that, everybody. Remember, send your questions and comments. Hashtag Safari Live. And we'll do our level best to answer anything you'd like to ask us. Well, within reason, of course. Jasper, I'm not sure I've heard from you before, so thank you for sending through a question. You say you also were hoping to see Ellie's. Well, here you go. And they're really rather easy to spot here, of course, because they don't tend to hide in the trees. I suspect during the night they head more into the trees, but during the daytime they come out and they feed on the grass here. And so we see quite a lot of them. Project Alpha, I'm not sure what you mean by this. You say Mara LEC seems so much more antisocial than the ones up at the Kruger or in the Kruger. Um, Project Alpha, I'm not sure what you mean. Would you like to clarify slightly? I mean, they live in herds. Uh, the herds are roughly the same size. Um, they seem relatively close to each other. You know what maybe you mean is that they spend time further away from each other than they would perhaps in uh, in the Kruger. And I think probably what you'll find is the reason for that is that they can see each other more easily here. They don't need to be quite so close to each other. So I think maybe that's why, you know, because of the security offered by the open space, they can see any th potential threat that there might be. Whereas, of course, in the thicker bush that we have around South Africa, well, it's just not quite the same. So I think uh, everything is fine with these elephants. I think they are well, just as social, just as pleased to be around each other as all the others. Marvellous. The trees that you can see in the background there are of a tributary that leads down into the Mara River. And it is that kind of, mm, I guess what they might call a long zaga. I think what you'll find is that that is the boundary of the Angama Pride of Lions, or certainly close to it. We're hopefully going to pop along and see them just now. Project Alpha, you say, have clarified. You say it seems that they don't come to us to visit us quite as much. Again, I think that you will find that that is a function of space. Because we don't, well, first of all, we don't drive off road very much here at all. Um, and so we don't we don't approach them quite as closely but also because the area is more open we see them more easily than we would at a place like Juma and we see them more quickly than we would there and so they're inevitably going to be slightly further away and because they have space to move in often they were, you know, they just don't have to come towards us to to go where they're going. But sometimes in a place like the Kruger, you know, there are bushes and trees and stumps and thickets and things in the way. And so you happen to be, you know, if you're in an open area where you can see where they're moving, uh, the chances are that they're moving in that area for a reason and that there aren't many other places to move, if you know what I mean. I do think there is an element, though, definitely, that in the private reserves, the small private reserves like Juma, what happens is that the animals do become that much more habituated. 
because they have a much more intimate experience of human beings, which of course means that the experience that we have of them is that much more intimate than it might be, say, in a place like this. But I think you'll find that the more time we spend here and the more we get to recognize individual animals from the herds and from the prides of lions, etc., I think the more you'll find that that intimacy uh, that we have conjured or not conjured, developed and um, nurtured over the years and at Juma will develop here too. But remember, Juma's been going as a Safari Live destination for, well, nine years. Right, now I believe that Tristan has found something that we do not find over here. And that means, of course, well, it's one of my favorite antelope. And so I ask you very kindly to go and say, a fond, fond greeting to the Nyala with Tristan. Well, James, I'm afraid it's not the Nyala. It is the cousin of the Nyala. It is a kudu, but from that angle it would be very difficult to know which one is which. But we shall bid them a fond hello from you when I do see some Nyala, and we'll, we'll address the kudu too. Kudu, James Sendry says his regards and says hello. There we go, James. We've passed on the message to the kudu, and they seem not really too perturbed. We'll have to have a word with them about their rude manners, and they'll have to tell you, send their regards. Now, I've still got bits of grass everywhere, so let's get rid of that. I'm going to just move forward a bit so we can actually see our kudu now that they've tucked themselves behind a branch. Is that better, Craig? I know it's still not great, but at least it looks a little bit better from my angle. You tell me if it's better. There we go. So you can see she's just grooming herself at the moment. And you'll find that a lot of the antelope do do this. They've got these very rigid teeth that almost have these kind of triangular shapes to them. And those work really well for running through fur and getting rid of all the loose fur and any sort of parasites that may potentially be on the coat itself. So it's quite common to see antelope grooming that way. And they'll often sort of bend their necks back and it just shows how flexible they are to be able to bend all the way back and touch their tail. Imagine being able to sort of bend your neck all the way around and towards your tailbone. It would be quite something if somebody could do that. So there are people in this world that are contortionists and can pull off tricks like that but I suppose none of us that we know. Craig, can you do that? No, Craig can't do that. There we go, now we've got your attention. Are you going to say hello back to James? No. Not yet. It would have been quite funny if it did have a sort of bark and then would have meant that there was probably a predator around but it would have worked quite well if it had barked at us when I asked that. But you can see how well their camouflage works. Just that coloration blends so, so well even into the grass from a far sort of distance. Once they get behind a tree, those white stripes break up that body and it becomes very, very difficult to see what you well, to make out what that animal actually is, and that's what they rely on. So they'll get into thicker, denser areas, and it's why they're moving away from us now. They're trying to sort of go to where it's a little bit thicker and there's more trees that they can hide behind, and therefore camouflage a bit better. It's a typical thing with kudu. They very seldom actually stand right out in the open. Now, James was talking about earlier about antelope species that they don't get there, and Yala is one of them. They also don't, but up there, they get an animal called a lesser kudu. I can't remember if it's found in the Mara or not. I don't think so. I think it's a little bit further to the southeast on the, the coastline near Savo. There's the lesser kudu there. It looks very similar. It almost looks like an in-between Nyala and kudu. It's, it's got the same sort of horn structure as a Nyala, but it's the gray coloration of a kudu and is much smaller than these greater kudu that you see here in South Africa. Roshni, you say you love the dish ears. I know, Roshni, they are great, aren't they? It's one of the best things about the Nyalas and Kudus is the massive ears that they possess. And particularly when they stare at you and the ears kind of focus on you and they're sort of listening to everything that you're saying, it almost looks quite comical. They have a bit of a Mickey Mouse look to them with such large, rounded ears. It's a pity they're not a little bit more round because then they would look... Oh, big yawn. Has it been a long day, girl? I would imagine so. Isn't she elegant? You can see a few little bits of mange on her neck, which is quite common in the kudu. You see it quite a bit, and that's nothing to be concerned about. You find it quite a lot 
in Kuru in the winter months they all get over it during the summer and that's not a very bad infestation either it's just a few little patches on the neck itself and you'll find she'll itch a little bit but not too bad and she'll get out of it as soon as the rains come again the mites that cause mange are not very tolerant of water so as soon as it gets wet again those mites tend to disappear and so not too bad we saw last year with the droughts obviously we had some of the lions that got mange but a lot of the kudu got it too and in time it just disappears and you can see a lot of them are now back to normal again so she'll be just fine oh that's quite cute the two of them are sort of rubbing up on one another are they grooming each other yes they are look at that a little bit of aloe grooming which is not very common in the antelope species you see it a lot in impalas but kudu you don't see it nearly as often and you see how she uses her teeth almost like a comb and that one's just basically going to the parlor and then she's being groomed see how the teeth is used that's very cool look at that so Megan if you can just repeat that sorry you broke up a little bit I didn't hear exactly the question that you're asking Uh, AKA, you're wondering if their tongue is very rough. Well, AKA, I can honestly say that I've never felt a kudu tongue. So I'm not 100% sure, but just in my sort of look of the tongue, it seems like it's very similar to what ours is, that it'll have a sort of rougher top part where there'll be the taste bud areas and, and then underneath is a little bit more soft and slimy. What is interesting with kudu is they have a very similar tongue to what you see on giraffe in that they'll have very few blood vessels and nerve endings on the tip of the tongue and that's why the tongue is almost a gray black color and because there's not very much blood that's getting to the surface of the tongue and it's got a thick layer that will allow them to feed off these sharp thorn trees that they do feed on but it's not the tongue that's grooming you can see watch when they groom how they use their teeth so the tongue will lick through and, and will be able to pick up sort of any little bits of loose fur once the teeth have gone through. You see, you see how her lower jaw goes? And she actually uses her teeth rather than her tongue. Yes, we're talking about the two of you.